Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for today's event on media bans, free speech, and disinformation in Ukraine. My name is Nina Yankovich, and I am the Disinformation Fellow for the Science and Technology Innovation Program here at the Wilson Center, which is co-sponsoring today's event with the Kennan Institute. We invite you to stay up to date with the Kennan Institute by visiting our website and especially our Focus Ukraine blog, which recently released two pieces on this very subject written by myself and Brian Milakovsky. For those in our audience that may not know me, I spent 2016 and 2017 advising the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry on strategic communications and disinformation under the auspices of a Fulbright Clinton Public Policy Fellowship. In 2019, I returned to Ukraine to cover issues related to disinformation during the country's historic presidential election. Now, you probably know that Ukraine has always been a laboratory for disinformation and Russian influence operations, particularly since 2013 and the revolution of dignity. So it was an important topic during the 2019 vote. Then President Petro Poroshenko promised to stick with an aggressive approach to countering Russian influence, including through bans of several social media networks and websites that he had enacted during his administration. But then candidate Volodymyr Zelensky publicly discussed rolling back such bans and actively reaching out to Ukraine's Russian speaking community. He has done the latter in his term, but not the former. And last month, President Zelensky surprised Ukrainians and Ukraine watchers alike when he signed a decree sanctioning three television stations affiliated with Viktor Medvedchuk, a Ukrainian oligarch with ties to the Kremlin. Ukrainian citizens are divided on this decision, with some believing it to be a necessary step and others finding it a restriction on citizens' rights to freedom of expression. Today, we're going to discuss whether bans like these are effective in fighting state-sponsored disinformation and what this decision implies for freedom of speech in Ukraine and the entire post-Soviet region and beyond going forward. We are very lucky to have three Ukrainian experts with us this morning sharing their opinions. Each of our speakers is going to give some opening remarks. I'm going to moderate a discussion amongst all of us, and then we're gonna open it up to your questions. So throughout the program, you can submit your questions via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter to at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Please do include your name and affiliation so we know who we're speaking with. And now we're going to open it up to our speakers. I'll introduce them one by one uh, before they give their opening remarks. Our first speaker today is Viktor Andrusev. He is a political and civic activist and since 2016, the executive director of the Ukrainian Institute for the Future, which specializes in national security, international and domestic politics, economics, law, and educational reforms. He started his professional career in 2008 as a deputy editor in the state news agency Ukrainform. In 2008, uh, 2010, he was involved in a campaign on adoption and implementation of access to public information in Ukraine. He has worked as an expert at the Ukrainian Center for Independent Political Research. From 2015 to 2016, he served as vice governor of the Donetsk region, where he was responsible for the humanitarian sphere. He developed a regional state program for the protection of internally displaced persons' rights. Dr. Andrusev has been featured in prominent Ukrainian media, such as Ukrainska Pravda, Glavkom, and others. He was the editor of Guidelines of Access to Public Information in State Bodies and the author of the book, To Change the Future. Victor, we're very happy to have you here this morning and the floor is yours. Thank you, Nina. Thank you for a chance to participate in this discussion. Uh, I think we need even more of these discussions uh, about what is going on in Ukraine, because uh, as uh, history shows, uh, what happens in Ukraine will meet you a few years later. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, also I have to say that I had a good experience of involving in the informational warfare because I was helping to the Ministry of Information uh, to create the project, which was uh, called iArmy, Informational uh, Army of, of Ukraine. So uh, con con uh, concerning what has happened last month in Ukraine, 
Zelensky has made a very strong step, which was really unexpected for him and blocked uh, the channels uh, which are related to Mr. Medvedchuk, who is also, and it's important to note, a cousin of, uh, to the Mr. Putin. So, uh, and he has a lot of connections to Russia. And uh, now we have a lot of published also audio recordings, which shows that he really was uh, coordinating his uh, activity with uh, Surkov and other Russians uh, informational uh, warfare managers. But uh, at, at this step actually has uh, several uh, problems, uh, which actually on, on my opinion, are not uh, solving problem with the Russian propaganda. First of all, uh, we should look for the real audience of, of these channels. And uh, it was really poor audience. And in, at the best time, uh, these three channels uh, together could uh, uh, scope for around 3% of uh, television audience. So they, are, they were very small uh, TV channels. And uh, the, their influence was really limited and on, on society. And we uh, cannot uh, connect uh, the support for, uh, for example, for Medvedchuk and his party uh, through the activity with these channels. Uh, and, and this is very important to note, uh, th this thing. Um, the other problem uh, was that after these channels were blocked, the audience, this small audience, uh, did not uh, uh, go to, to pro-Ukrainian TV channels or uh, other media projects. Uh, most of them went uh, to uh, TV channels, which has a very uh, approximate discourse about the Russia support. For example, this is a ch TV channel, Nash, who is actually tripled uh, his uh, audience. And uh, this, this shows that as the question of, of banning the channels is, is not uh, the way the situation is uh, resolved. Uh, also, uh, the uh, decision of Zelensky can be also a uh, uh, slow, slow, uh, slow bomb of slow uh, uh, action because uh, he violated uh, law. So this was a political decision, uh, which uh, uh, not so good uh, correlates with uh, uh, laws and then constitution, because he he uh, adopted the sanctions against Ukrainian citizens who are in Ukraine. So uh, it, previously we already had uh, cases when uh, the sanctions were adopted against Ukrainians. But these Ukrainians were not in, inside the state. So, if, for example, if you blame Mr. Medvedchuk or his formal owner of the channels, Taras Kozak, about the cooperation with the terrorists, so you should use the legal instruments like uh, prosecution, uh, secret service, uh, police. Uh, they should be uh, detained or, or interrogated and another thing. So when you go with these steps, it's not a, a proper instrument uh, to, to deal with them because they are inside Ukraine. And this is, uh, can cause a, a lot of problems for him because uh, a month already passed, uh, the channels were blocked for uh, financing by um, the cooperation with the terrorists. But uh, Mr. Kozak and Medvedchuk uh, did not uh, visit uh, often our law enforcement agencies, uh, what actually should happen. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, in a few months later, they will uh, have some uh, court decisions on, on which will uh, be on their side that this was violating of their rights. And uh, so here is no, uh, uh, Zelensky should go to the end. And uh, if he blocked the channel, so he should continue and, and the, they should be investigated. The activity of Medvedchuk and Kozak should be investigated and they should uh, finally got the decisions of the courts about their activity. Uh, meanwhile, I would like also to, uh, to say a little bit more about Russian propaganda. Uh, when, we, when we want to beat Russian propaganda through blocking some uh, TV channels or other things, uh, I don't think this is a useful approach. And actually, uh, the situation which has happened uh, when Poroshenko blocked uh, uh, Russian social networks uh, shows that uh, the situation did not improve very much uh, after that. 
uh, you have to understand that uh, people uh, look uh, for other ways to get the information which actually get they used to. Uh, the Russians are not widening their audience in Ukraine. They, for the moment, are preserving the target audience they already have. So they work for the people with uh, pro-Russian uh, um, worldview and minds. And, uh, and for them, it's very important to keep contact with them. So when you block Odnoklasniki and Vkontakti, uh, they will uh, develop the Telegram channels or, uh, or YouTube channels or other things. And they will again, or Viber uh, groups, and they will again tackle their audience. And uh, uh, actually, uh, when we look, for example, on the case of Mr. Shari, who was actually not popular on television, he created his political party and political influence using the social network instruments. He has a lot of uh, a million of uh, uh, viewers on YouTube. Uh, he has a lot of uh, followers in Telegram and, and so on, and he is spreading total Russian propaganda, fakes, and other things. And he is very popular. His political party is, not, is even represented in local councils in Ukraine, and they have ratings around 2-3% uh, from population. So my message is that uh, you, you cannot, uh, we cannot defeat the Russian propaganda with blocking the channels because the channels are only the instruments to bring the information. What we do should do really, uh, we should create the uh, um, new content, uh, better content, alternative content. We should create the alternative channels. Uh, we should create the more trust to what the state is saying, the agencies are doing, or we should create a more trust to pro Ukrainian uh, media and uh, and what, this is what we should do. And with, uh, with the special content uh, products and other things, we should bring people to more uh, objective and more trustful media. And, and this is the only way. Uh, you cannot, uh, if you all the time are beating the consequences of Russian propaganda, you will lose because they, uh, they uh, go through the evolution all the time. They, every month, they change their approaches uh, to, to how they spread information and, 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 and how they bring the messages. Also, you have to take into account that Russians are not acting only through the media. For example, they have the Russian church. And then the Russian charge is also a, a huge instrument of uh, propaganda influence in Ukraine, in Ukraine especially. Uh, they have uh, different uh, uh, groups, cultural groups, and, and, and other things, how they spread also and collect people who think in, in their way. And um, I will not continue more. I would like to give a, a word to other speakers. But uh, at the end, I have to say that we should follow not uh, only the propaganda, but intensity, in, 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 intensity of the propaganda. Because normally, uh, the Russians, uh, uh, the propaganda is supporting the Russian military operations. So when we see the increasing of Russian fakes and interventions, it means that they prepare also some real steps. Normally, if they do not have such plans, they are not acting very, uh, very intensively. So uh, this is uh, like a marker of what are the plans of Russians. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Very interesting and uh, something that I often say in my own work when we're talking about banning specific channels or if we are uh, you know, taking certain content off of social networks, I call that playing whack-a-troll. And in a way, <laughs> we are kind of playing whack-a-troll here with, with channels in Ukraine, it seems, uh, based on your opinion. Next, we're going to move to Angelina Karyakina, who is a journalist and editor based in Kyiv. She has reported on Ukrainian political and social affairs, including the Maidan demonstrations and the conflict in Eastern Ukraine for the Kyiv Bureau of Euronews, and has also worked as a journalist and presenter for Hromadsky, Ukraine's major independent media outlet, where she covered the cases of Igor Sensov and Alexander Kolchenko and conducted award-winning investigative reporting. From 2017 to 2020, she was the editor-in-chief at Hromadsky, and in March 2020, she co-founded the Public Interest Journalism Lab, which seeks to pop popularize best practices for public interest journalism in the digital age. She is currently a media manager and editor at the Ukrainian Public Broadcaster. 
And before we go over to Angelina, just a reminder that if you have questions for our guests and the panel, you can submit them via email to Kenan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kenan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Please do include your name and affiliation. Angelina, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Victor, so much. Um, just a quick note uh, towards your um, whack a troll um, sort of um, game uh, in Ukraine. I think it's, it's very important to stress that this decision to ban a number of channels doesn't come alone as just a, as just a decision against the channels. Um, several weeks ago, we had another decision from the Ukrainian um, National Security Council um, which con constitutes, well, they, they have a number of sanctions against Medvedchuk, Viktor Medvedchuk, uh, uh, personal sanctions uh, against his wife, Oksana Marchenka, and uh, against um, the families of his allies. It means that uh, this specific step comes also with other activities that, uh, well, may ban lots of things that Medvedchuk is, is, is doing um, in Ukraine, not only in terms of um, media and, and politics, but also money. Um, yesterday we had, um, there was some fresh news coming from Ukraine, right? Um, we, we had news from the security service saying that uh, there were a number of uh, searchings uh, in companies um, allied with Medvedchuk's um, gas stations, Glusko. Um, so uh, we can see that it's not only, you know, it's not only one thing that may look like a, a popular step, uh, especially among patriotic uh, audience and electorate in Ukraine, but also a number of other th uh, steps coming. We will see, you know, how they will play out in courts and what, what the, the, the real effect of that will be. But it seems to be something bigger, you know, than just uh, playing uh, with with Russian propaganda and uh, Medvedchuk owned uh, or allied media, but uh, let me talk about the mechanism itself. I think there are lots of people who are watching or listening uh, now um, us uh, in Ukraine and abroad who are asking themselves why specifically sanctions. Ukraine is a European country with a rule of law why there was no uh, ruling of court or why the Ukrainian national regulator, the, the sort of Ukrainian Ofcom, didn't do anything uh, about that. So let me just explain a little bit uh, this uh, specific mechanism because I've been trying to understand myself why, why, uh, why sanctions. Um, obviously, it's a matter of national security. And uh, I, think, um, I think that uh, Zelensky didn't have uh, lots of options here. Uh, if he would go, he or let's say the system that he represents, um, uh, after Medvedchuk's media, as a as media, let's say breaching professional standards or being politically biased or something else, I think he would, he would have faced um, a great challenge, challenge here because the audience will be asking and the civil society will be asking, okay, what about other channels, other channels owned by other oligarchs? Um, it is impossible to talk about this specific steps without uh, this specific step without um, understanding the general structure of Ukrainian media market and the ownership of Ukrainian media market. It's basically owned by four major oligarchs. Akhmetov, Pinchuk, Kalamoyevsky, um, Lovachkin, Firtash, sort of as a, a alliance, and um, plus two, uh, Medvedchuk, formerly, and Poroshenko, who is also a media mogul. And um, generally, in the whole structure of the media, which is basically um, TV market, overcrowded, one of the most overcrowded media markets in Europe. Um, they, this group of people control around, I don't have a specific number, but around 70% of the whole audience. Each holding and each channel is politically biased according to the business and political interests of their own uh, owner. And uh, of course, if you go out with the decision to go after Medvedchuk, you know, as, a, as an owner of a politically biased channels or the channels that... Uh, push uh, forward um, a political agenda, there's a normal question, what do you do with other owners? 
why don't you ban other owners because of you know breaching professional standards um, just a little story to illustrate how Ukrainian um, Ukrainian audience watch TV. Let me just tell you a short story about my parents. So they would normally uh, start their evening uh, with watching um, a, a very popular news show uh, on the channel owned by Kolomoisky. Then they will switch to the channel owned by Pinchuk, and then they will switch to the channel and to, to see some uh, political talk shows on the channels owned by uh, Poroshenko and formerly Medvedchuk. Uh, in their, it, it's, it's an average Ukrainian family, working family from central Ukraine. In their logic, um, after they watch five or seven news shows, they sort of have this picture of the day like a balanced picture of the day. This is, an, this is their understanding of balance and pluralism in Ukraine, which actually doesn't you know, provide them the real picture of the day. It's just a, a number of different politically biased shows, which doesn't really give them a real, real picture. But um, um, in order to regulate it and in, in, in order to, to have this picture, there are so many steps that, that should be taken uh, by the Ukrainian civil society, by um, the media themselves, independent media, I mean, in terms of self-regulation, self uh, that uh, one decision against, you know, one owner doesn't seem to be like a major working step, but as a first step, I think is, uh, is a good start. So um, let me just quickly, um, quickly reflect on what, uh, what could be done. But before I go there, uh, I also wanted um, to very, very shortly um, touch upon the way uh, the propaganda works and um, the way Medvedchuk's uh, channels used to operate, the holding used to operate. Um, since the beginning of the war in 2014, the Russian propaganda, you know, the Russian explicit, the, the, the explicit pro-Kremlin uh, narratives um, are quite harder to sell in Ukraine. So it doesn't work the way it used to work in 2014. Um, it's more, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of micro narratives that depend on a day to day agenda. For example, today it might be the IMF or the land reform. Tomorrow it might be the vaccination. The day after tomorrow it might be something, you know, something else, the EU agreement, the association agreement or something else. So it, it's not really, you know, so blunt as it used to be. Russia is good, the rest of the world is bad and Ukraine is a totally failed state. But, um, but the, uh, the macro narrative there that Ukraine is really uh, a failed state, that Ukraine doesn't really, that Ukraine doesn't know what to do, you know, with its own people, with its own country, with its own government, that there is this, you know, big Western um, external control over Ukraine, uh, the, the uh, Soros and his, you know, allies, Sorosata all around that control Ukraine, and all these other things. This is exactly the narratives that Medvedchuk holding used to play with. And um, if you turn to the law, uh, if you turn to the you know, constitution and, and, and other and, and media practices, but basically legislation, it looks like just the general political bias. <laughs> this is why it is, you know, hard to stick in this decision in the framework of a national regulator or, um, uh, or legislation uh, and um, to ban these channels uh, in the way they should be, you know, banned in any country uh, with, with, with the rule of law. Uh, this is why, for example, this, um, these channels used to have um, several warnings from the national regulators. They were not banned, but they used to have warnings um, against um, hate speech, uh, against uh, news marathons like uh, It Stinks Like Soros. It's the name of the show that used to run on one of the Medvedchuk's um, <laughs> channels and, and, and other things. This is just, you know, a short, a, a sh some, some context to explain to the audience why sanctions. Um, it is really the matter of uh, national security, not only because it really pushes forward um, this, uh, the, the macro narrative that Ukraine is generally uh, a failed state, but also even if you, um, 
even if you uh, take uh, the, the most uh, acute problem and topic right now, vaccination, uh, it is also a matter of um, national, uh, national security when these channels, the, 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 the holdings, you know, talk um, um, about vaccines um, developed by the rest of the world as, as failed vaccines, unlike the Sputnik, the Russian vaccine. And generally, um, it raises concern among people because Sputnik will never come to Ukraine because of political reasons. Uh, Ukrainians will not be vaccinated by Sputnik. It's the decision of the government. Um, people ask themselves, uh, okay, so um, if, if we cannot trust anything else, maybe we, sh we shouldn't get vaccinated at all, you know, and, all, um, and, and other questions like that. I will probably um, disagree a little bit with uh, Victor on, on the subject of impact of these, um, of these uh, channels. I mean, of course, we, we're here to discuss these things, but from the polls that we, from the recent polls that we've seen, um, the, the Medvedchuk party lost uh, up to well, two or three percent in polls after the channels were closed down. So, um, of course, uh, if you look at their total share of the market, which was around 3%, it's really, it's really low. Um, but there are also lots of other factors that played into the hands of these channels. For example, uh, last year, um, all of the biggest media holdings closed down, uh, coded basically their channels on the satellites. So Ukrainians living in smaller um, cities and villages who had an open access to the satellites, who were watching these channels there, um, they, they lost all of the national channels and all of the channels that provided something else apart from hard news, you know, Ukrainian X Factors and, and, T and other TV shows. So uh, what they were left with uh, were the free, um, they were free, free of charge, uh, free informational channels. And these were also Medvedchuk's channels. Mm. It's also, I think, an, an important factor just when we talk about the, the way Ukrainian media market uh, lo looks like. Um, just a little thing for everyone to, to, to know. Um, and another another thing I would uh, um, I would touch upon uh, it's 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 probably a, a topic for another big discussion, but um, what what is essential here uh, in this decision and in the way Ukrainian media market operates? Um, it's a democratic free country, and pluralism is one of the key things for, for the civil society and for democracy. Unfortunately, um, I would say that for the past seven years, um, the public space for open discussions of many things, say the communist legacy or the, the Soviet past or the way relations um, between nations should be developing uh, is narrowed down. Uh, this is my, my feeling. And uh, I think the, that um, the way people are, you know, like my parents are switching channels and looking for uh, other thoughts and other media uh, is, uh, is a sign that there is really, you know, lack, uh, la real lack of pluralism, not, you know, pluralism in the way I need to hear several biased thoughts. Uh, I need to hear an open discussion, a fair discussion, which I trust. And I think Ukrainian audience really lacks it. Um, the, reason, uh, the reason is that we really lack independent media. The public broadcaster where I currently work, um, year from year lacks finances. And you know, when we, we are talking about finances, we're talking about new popular TV shows that attracts audience that, uh, you know, people don't watch, you know, news as news. They, they watch them after uh, popular um, entertainment shows, after popular TV series. So it's essential that uh, public broadcasters or independent media, you know, they, they have something to attract broader audience. Um, people lack um, independent local media 
they look for it and they, they, they don't find it. Um, and this is why they turn to bloggers like Shari. This is why they turn to a media like Medvedchuk's. N not because you know, of, of the mere reason that they share uh, partially conspiratorial theories that are spread there, that they share the thought, you know, uh, thoughts that were spread there, that, uh, you know, Russia is not part of the conflict, really, that U Ukrainian war is a civil war and not Russian-Ukrainian war or other things. What the, polls are uh, uh, what the polls are saying is that the majority of Ukrainians do really think that Russia is the biggest threat to Ukraine still. Um, and even if we know that the Medvedchuk's party is one of the four, it, it depends on, you know, on the terms of polls, but it's one of the third most popular or one of the fourth most popular party in Ukraine. Still, people are looking for um, other sources of information, for open discussion, for fair um, you know, debates, uh, for other thoughts, because Ukraine is a big and complicated country. And um, we, as civil society, media, academics, need to think how to provide people with this. We need to think how empower them, how make them feel a part you know, of the broader discussion, part of the public life in the country. We need to think how to uh, you know, get rid of this feeling that uh, many Ukrainians share, the feeling of helplessness, that they cannot do anything about the reforms, that they can, cannot do anything about the war, that their voice is not really heard. So um, maybe it will be just, a, just another question for us to discuss uh, what we can do with this feeling of lack of agency uh, among uh, Ukrainian um, people in different uh, parts of the country. Um, that is one of the steps to actually battle um, propaganda and disinformation. Wonderful. Thank you, Angelina. And even though you and Victor disagree a little bit about the nuts and bolts, I do hear um, some synergy there in terms of uh, reaching out to people and providing an alternative source of, of news, uh, an authoritative, trusted voice, and something that is also fun to consume, infotainment. I, I'm sure we'll get to some of the uh, provisions that the Zelensky government has made to reach out to those populations and whether you think that they're working in our Q&A. But before that, we do have one more speaker and a reminder that if you have questions for our guests or for me, you can submit them via email to kenan at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter at Kenan Institute or on our Facebook play page. And of course, do include your name and affiliation. Uh, last but not least today, we have Mikhailo Minakov, who is the Kennan Institute's own senior advisor on Ukraine and the editor-in-chief of our Focus Ukraine blog. He is also the editor-in-chief of the Ideology and Politics Journal and earned his Master of Arts degree in philosophy from the Kiev Mokila Academy and defended his doctoral dissertation at the Kiev Institute of Philosophy in 2007. For 18 years, he taught at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Kiev Mohila Academy. And Mikhailo's main interest is dedicated to political modernization in Eastern Europe, theories and practices of revolutions, political imagination, and ideologies. Misha, the floor is yours. You're on mute. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Nina. Um, uh, we just heard two positions by Angelina and Victor that are differ. First of all, was it uh, a successful step to actually counter the Russian propaganda in Ukraine? And it's, I, I'm also split. I have part of the arguments uh, that I agree with, with Angelina and part, partly um, I agree with Victor. And that's uh, the, the, the problem here. So I try to analyze the situation and the decision on the closure of the channels and the persecution of uh, Viktor Medvedchuk and his uh, clan from the point of view of uh, the development of political development of Ukraine and of current regime. And basically what I see is that the constitutional, the, the basic constitutional principles are now endangered. So uh, by looking at the different uh, major constitutionally uh, defined uh, bodies of power, bodies of authority, 
they are losing the real power in uh, contemporary Ukrainian politics. So cabinet of ministers is very uninfluential. Parliament is very uninfluential. Now constitutional court is uh, blocked. It cannot function properly. Instead, we see the rise of the uh, Security Council that turns from consulting or consultory uh, body, this is how it's uh, mentioned in the constitution, into a core coordinating center of executive branch that also oversees a lot of different spheres. So it's really for a post-communist country where the democratic quality of the political culture was always uh, under question, here, this kind of uh, development is very worrisome. And uh, of course, uh, in a way, the three channels that are now closed, they do not deliver the pro-Russian message. Again, this pro-Russian message, as Angelina was rightly saying, was very specifically packed. However, we also do not see and we do not hear now the voices of pro-presidential people who are in constant debate with the uh, this pro, what, what is it called? The opposition platform for life party. So these TV channels were a major discussion place between uh, ruling party and this kind of opposition. Now it's gone and it, it's this type of, uh, this faction of Ukrainian society is now left on its own. I read recently several analytical papers by Ukrainian scholars saying that many of the audience, it's not a big portion, two or 3%, but they moved uh, to watch Russian television directly. And that's actually a loss for Ukrainian case. I hope it will be rectified with time, but so far it makes it even harder. And I agree with Angelina that there should be a promotion of more uh, balanced debate uh, on Ukrainian public television, on Hromatsky itself. However, we also don't see uh, that the, these two TV channels are actually gaining the audience, partially because of financial restrictions, but maybe there's something else. And that's another uh, part of the problem. So for me, uh, right now, there's a question that uh, the uh, decision on sanctions, which is very uh, questionable in terms of legality and constitutionality in Ukraine, they do not have big effect on Russian propaganda in Ukraine. However, they make an, uh, this disbalance in political competition and functioning of constitution. Well, is, isn't it a high price for such a minimal effect? I'll stay with this and I'm ready to answer the questions. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I'm going to ask that we address the elephant in the room. We've all three kind of discussed uh, whether we think the sanctions were legal, whether they were necessary, whether uh, they were effective, but what about the effect on freedom of speech in Ukraine. Uh, when President Poroshenko uh, passed or announced the social media ban of VK Adnaklasniki in 2017, I remember the immediate reaction of most Western Ukraine watchers and indeed the European Union and the United States at the time was uh, careful because this is a direct, you know, um, indirect contravention to freedom of expression norms in Ukraine. And even uh, in the early days of the Zelensky administration, um, so at the end of 2019 and before the coronavirus pandemic, we saw the Minister of Culture um, trying to develop some anti disinformation laws, laws on regulation of the media that. Again, we saw uh, some advocates for freedom of expression really cautioning against because they were putting uh, too much of a, a rein on the media in that case. And here we have this decision to, to ban three Russian uh, pro-Russian TV channels. Um, Angelina, I hear your point that this is a package of measures to curb Medvedchuk's influence overall. But what impl implications does this have for broader freedom of expression issues in Ukraine? And should there be, even if we deem these sanctions necessary and effective, 
should there be some introduction of either a sunset clause or some curbing of the executive power of such sanctions? Because one thing that worries me is the tit for tat that we see a lot in, in discussions of politics and media in Ukraine. Uh, I recall during the 2019 election that both the Poroshenko and Zelensky campaigns were lobbying insults back and forth through their respective media outlets that were supporting them um, and probably could have claimed that there was disinformation there. How do we prevent a future Ukrainian administration for, from using these uh, sanctions for political purposes? And uh, let's start with Victor for that question. Well, uh, you know, uh, to ban something is always uh, the last and the weak decision and, and the most simple uh, decision. And because of that, it's not always uh, the best decision. Uh, you, actually, Ukrainian media uh, is in the trap for many years because uh, we really lack uh, of good uh, new uh, law which, which could regulate this sphere on, on, on the objective basis and then uh, creates more space for, for developing of independent media. Uh, we in Institute for the Future, we made the research of media market and you have to understand that uh, in Ukraine, uh, TV channels are not living from the money they earn. So they do not, uh, they, uh, the money they earn uh, on advertisement is, is a very small sum uh, and the part of, of the budget. And uh, the problem of that, uh, that, they, that they are donated with the oligarchs uh, creates a not relevant uh, uh, situation in media market when uh, different small and big uh, media can compete for the audience. Yes, because the big media, they have uh, not limited budget uh, to survive and they don't care of, of uh, how much they earn. At the same time, the independent media should look for, for the costs and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and for the money. The same is about the uh, state uh, media, which also depends on the concrete sum, which is in the budget. It's also do not create uh, for you a lot of space for development. So the problem is about the new law. And the new law is always in the trap because we have a really big freedom of speech uh, because, for example, uh, you have to know that most of Ukrainian popular uh, internet media are not registered as a media. They are just a popular uh, website and Ukrainska Pravda for many years, they didn't register uh, as a media because they don't need, uh, according to Ukrainian law, you don't have to, to be registered. And, and this causes a lot of other problems because Shari media also do not register. They say, okay, we are media just in internet. So we do all the things. And this is a kind of trap. Uh, however, for many years, and actually during the Poroshenko times, the right decision to change the situation was to create uh, the funding of media. So uh, each TV channel, each media should have a strict report where you get money. And uh, if that would, would happen to the Medvedchuk channels, for sure they could not show uh, the official money they earn because uh, most of them are in cash uh, brought uh, by this uh, oil business and other things. The same about uh, oligarchs TV channels. They do not, uh, they cannot show the official uh, money because they don't get money from the advertisement and other things. So with, with this uh, simple norm, which actually was adopted in, in, in Georgia, uh, it could really uh, change situation because if you cannot explain where it, for what you got, uh, got that money, it means that you are serving for some not objective interests. So it, it means that we can make sanctions on you and, and, and other things. But uh, Ukrainian uh, civil society uh, was a small civil society is uh, afraid of any law and any changes to the media law because they're afraid that this, this, with the small changes, the state can make uh, big changes which will empower uh, them. And this is a trap. We do not change the law. We have too much freedom of speech. And this is used for also for propaganda, for manipulations, as the same as for spreading the independent media. But I have to say that finally, what I see uh, the independent media 
uh, lose this battle and, and, and will lose it even more because you cannot compete with the uh, budgets of Russian uh, FSB. Uh, you cannot compete with the money of Kolomoisky or Akhmetov and you have no chance to survive in this uh, uh, more freedom and uh, uh, an open uh, battle. There is no chance. And actually this is what has happened. So uh, for me, uh, I, I think that the question is not about banning. The question is about the new law, which actually could create the uh, reduction, uh, this uh, journalist committee inside each uh, TV channel, which can be independent from the owner. And this should be uh, implemented in the law that you have a uh, reduction, uh, I mean, the people, uh, an editor, editorial board who is independent on, on, on the owner. And this editorial board should be uh, protected by the law. At the same time, we see how you how the channel earns money. And if we see that they uh, take money from nowhere, it's a, a question to the secret service to pay attention to this. This could be a better decision than just uh, a ban TV channels, because this is institutional approach. When you create uh, such a kind of politics, you create an institutional uh, way of solving this. But if you do like Zelensky did, it, we don't know with what this will take, uh, we will come back to you. Really interesting. And I think you illustrated kind of the push and the pull between uh, wanting to protect freedom of expression, but also needing to institute uh, new kind of guiding rules for um, for the media environment in Ukraine. I want to pose the same question to Angelina. We know uh, you think the ban was a good thing, but as a journalist, what are your um, perhaps reservations or what do you think a new structure should look like to uh, to create this? You referred to uh, this ban as a good first step. What would the next steps look like if we do want to protect freedom of expression in Ukraine? Well, there's indeed uh, a big discussion here in the media community in terms of how exactly the law on media should look like. I think there's a, um, there's a consensus among uh, professional media that uh, there should be total transparency uh, in terms of the beneficiaries of the media, you know, as, as a business, they, they don't they don't operate as business. Everybody knows that. Actually, the majority of, of media business in the world globally uh, do not earn uh, do not earn um, money. I mean, I'm not talking about New York Times and big tech companies that invest money in uh, huge uh, media projects like that. Um, but again, um, in in the countries of young democracy like Ukraine, it's always a question of how much the state regulates. Uh, media, how much the state regulates, um, you know, the sphere of the freedom of speech. Uh, I, I do not, you know, use words in the categories of too much freedom of speech on, or in, there, there, there could be not too much freedom of, not enough freedom of speech, but never too much freedom of speech, I think. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a matter of law that regulates what is, what is a crime in Ukraine. I mean, what, um, not what you ban, but what you could be punished for. If you are punished for thoughts, that is, a, I think, a very dangerous thing to start with. Um, but again, uh, getting back to your question, I think the question of transparency, uh, where the money comes, who are the beneficiaries, who are the owners, uh, how the media uh, operates uh, uh, in Ukraine is, uh, uh, is an essential question of the, all the 30 years of Ukrainian independence. That is one. The second one is, uh, mm, uh, is a question of the public broadcaster which is a huge resource nationally with uh, 23 plus the Crimean platform um, regional broadcasters, uh, independent of local uh, governments, independent of local uh, authorities. Uh, and uh, it, it's obvious that uh, it's the resource that should be operating, should be setting rules, professional rules, uh, should be setting, setting the professional agenda. Uh, so it, it, it needs uh, support. 
And um, again, it's the smaller, I think, really uh, coming myself from smaller independent projects, I think that the smaller independent media with not so much coverage, they do set the agenda. Well, look at the past seven years in Ukraine. The biggest, the, the most resonant um, investigations about the killing of Pavel Sheremet, about the corruption in the, um, in the defense sphere, um, uh, about, uh, about Medvedchuk himself, himself, are done by small independent investigative teams. Look at projects like Bellingcat. Um, it's, I, I think it's a new reality for the media. Uh, supported by um, donors, obviously, but also by their uh, dedicated and loyal audiences as well. And I think um, we cannot compare um, the, the shares, you know, of smaller investigative projects and uh, media owned by, for example, Kolomoisky or Pinchuk, but we can compare the impact uh, that is done by the smaller independent projects. This is why I think, you know, supporting in Ukraine the um, a big number of various, you know, various media initiatives, various uh, independent media projects uh, throughout the whole the whole country uh, can potentially do the difference as well. So if if we look again um, at the complex of measures that could be done, again uh, a normal healthy uh, legislation that will bring to light the beneficiaries and the way the, the, way the media are run and financed, then the support of uh, the, the public broadcaster and the support of smaller independent media initiatives could, you know, uh, in, in complex, uh, make a great difference uh, in, in the countries uh, with the challenges that Ukraine is facing. Let's not forget that hybrid war is war, is still a war, uh, I mean, we call it hybrid, but each day, you know, each two or three days, we get people killed at the front line. Uh, last year, we had over 130,000 breaches of ceasefire in, in, uh, in, in Donbass. So, uh, I mean, the war is still there, and it's always tricky to talk about freedom of speech and, and, and um, open society in a country which is at war. We, I mean, we should be also aware of this fact. Uh, it's not like, you know, talking about freedom of speech in, I don't know, Czech Republic. Uh, I, I would like that to be the same situation, but still there are factors like, like, uh, like the war and the constant threat from the neighboring country, which is always there and probably will, will be always there, um, which, which should be considered. Yeah, that's an incredibly important point and one that I think uh, always bears reminding that, you know, Ukraine is the country where there is a hot war and people are dying on an everyday basis. Um, of course, the, the war situation is exacerbating, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And the, I'm sorry, the garbage is getting collected at my house, if you can hear that. Uh, <laughs> but um, certainly, you know, the, uh, the situation with hybrid warfare means that there are real consequences for what people say online as well. Uh, last, to, to Misha, um, what are your thoughts on the, the freedom of speech conundrum and how it can be navigated in, in Ukraine? And then uh, we will turn to another question. Uh, thank you, Nina. I'm sure that the freedom of speech is definitely the value for uh, citizenry, uh, for the journalist society. However, uh, if you look at the behavior of oligarchic clans, owners of these channels or government, this uh, probably is not entirely the, the value. Uh, recently, we, we in Canon Institute have published the history of contemporary Ukraine. It's about these 30 years of experience of building or trying to build a democracy. And here you, we, we have a chapter how the Ukrainian mass media sector was developing, written by Marta Dichok and Diana Dutzek. And it's interesting that in this chapter, they constantly repeat that, yes, there was an attempt to establish a number of rules that would defend the uh, freedom of speech. However, there's always an attempt of different groups to take control over it. So uh, right now, we also see the, the both elements. So there, there's a community of journalists, especially in this smaller groups, as, as Angelina rightly pointed out, who 
really does a very good journalist job. However, if you look at the established channels or media outlets, they are less and less participating in it. So in a way, the, the institutions that were built, private or public, they are not efficient in informing citizens or providing the space for the open debate or informed debate. And that's the problem. However, if you look at the number of draft laws that prepare the reform, they are very dangerous. This is what uh, Victor was saying, that we need rules that would provide journalists with freedom to do their job, not to follow the interest of their owners. And uh, here we, we see these two famous or ill-famous uh, draft laws that basically are not that good in providing uh, the, the, the freedom for the journalists, but they definitely increase responsibility of the journalists uh, for what they do. And that's a problem. And the final issue, a non-resolved issue, it's connected with the argument that Angelina just have uh, spoken about, it's war. Well, it's war when a government or ruling group needs it. And it's not war when they don't need it. So for the trade with Russia, it's not a state of war. But when uh, journalists or intellectuals do their critical job, then they, this issue is raised. So it's critically important, sorry for, for the noise here in Milan, uh, uh, it's critically important that constitution is back at power. And if we have the state of war, and we definitely have it, then the state of war, which was also a rules-based situation with certain policies in place, with certain freedoms uh, not in place anymore, it should be introduced then by a responsible government. If it's not introduced, then it creates the gray zone, another hybrid zone in addition to the hybrid war, a hybrid politics that adds to this bad quality of government. Yeah, that's, that, that's the problem here. So yes, there is a value of freedom of speech, but it's not universally supported. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, so I feel like we could write our own uh, new media law here with, with the four of us. A lot of good ideas. I want to turn to some of the uh, steps that the Zelensky government has taken more in this proactive sphere um, rather than a reactive sphere that we've been talking about. And I think we all agree needs more investment in Ukraine. And certainly I'm a huge proponent of public media as well. Um, we know that Zelensky has, uh, you know, a TV pr production background. He has tried to revive the Russian language broadcaster and rebranded it. It's now called Dom. I'm wondering what your opinions about that effort are. And we just heard President Zelensky this week talk about the need for more media literacy education, including for uh, older individuals. Uh, there has been a little bit of that in Ukraine through the Ministry of Education in partnership with some of the Western uh, donors and implementers. And then Zelensky also announced, and I, I haven't heard much discussion of it, uh, the, a new Center for Information Resilience in Ukraine, sponsored by the United Nations. I'm, I'm wondering what your reactions to those initiatives are. Disinformation. If, disinformation uh, resilience. Uh, yes. Is that what they called it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, disinformation. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, Angelina, let's throw it over to you. Uh, reactions, other projects that perhaps we should know about or, or be considering supporting um, as Ukraine watchers, as donors and implementers who I'm sure are on the line today. Uh, well, I think starting from the from the latest, right, the the, the Center for Information Resilience. From what we know, um, something like that, like similar similar uh, centers were also is established in in European Union, supported by by NATO uh, earlier, like several years ago. Um, we are, uh, as, as a journalist and editor, I myself, um, I, I'm trying to understand how it will be functioning. I'm looking closely at what it's going to look like. Um, the center, uh, according to the well, press releases or statements, should start its uh, activities uh, next Tuesday. Uh, but we will be talking to different people who are helping establish it, and we will know more next week from what I, well, from, from, from what I See, I think it's not bad that it sort of um, um, should be running outside the office of uh, the president's office as a 
sort of advisory body uh, in the framework of what the National Security Council does. I don't think uh, I don't think that establishing another body on the governmental level or somewhere inside the office of president would be efficient. I mean, we've never seen something efficient uh, efficient uh, in terms of you know fighting disinformation and propaganda uh, before. Um, as, as to the DOM channel and um, let's say uh, working with reintegration and um, basically trying to do something to get this part of the country which was cut down from cut off from Ukraine by Russia uh, back into Ukrainian um, informational agenda. Uh, I think it's a very important step. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, how effective, you know, I don't have any numbers, I don't have an, anything in front of my eyes, but probably uh, soon, uh, sometime soon, I, I, I will have that. I think um, even just a mere possibility for, for the people in occupied territories to have something uh, to keep in touch with the Ukrainian reality um, is, is really good. Uh, it used to run all of the most popular Ukrainian TV shows as they as they opened up this channel, as they as they launched the channel. The agreement with the biggest TV holdings was that um, that the the, the 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 media holdings will hand down um, the most popular you know shows, and so that people in occupied territories could could watch it. So it's, it was more about starting with a, a, entertainment. Now they, from what I know, now they have more uh, hard news explanation, um, you know, covering covering social uh, issues um, next to the front line and generally in Donbass. Uh, we will see. I think it started out. Uh, it started out some process which should go hand in hand with the legislation on. Um, transitional justice, uh, which is also in place in Ukraine, uh, you know, as a bigger public discussion, which is frankly speaking, not there as a, you know, this big public open discussion of how we are going to get back Donbass and Crimea. How are we going to get back people who are um, um, living there? And actually under the pandemic, I should stress it, that the people are trapped uh, in Donbass only, um, two uh, out of uh, five uh, places where people can cross uh, are working. Only one is working constantly. And the second one in, in Luhansk region, Stanitsa Luhanska, and the other one is working only several days per week. So, and, and there are lots of numbers of, uh, mm, of things that um, do not let people, you know, cross, cross the, the checkpoints uh, back and forth, uh, lots of you know, lots of everyday tragedies there when people cannot go to the funeral of their loved ones or you know be here with with someone uh, whom they love. So it's a, it's it's it's, a, it's an important uh, step, and um, we'll see how it will work out. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I'd like to return to a little bit to why this happened now. Uh, a lot. Of, there's been a lot of speculation about what the motivation was and why it came suddenly out of the blue. And I would love to hear uh, Victor and Misha's uh, opinions on that. Uh, what? Why do you think the timing is what it was? Is it distracting us from something? Is it part of a larger campaign? Anything you have to elucidate the timing would be uh, interesting for our audience, I'm sure. Uh, Victor, let's start with you. So, well, um, answering to your question, I also would uh, connect uh, what is going on with Medvedchuk, his TV channel and other things with the failure of uh, Donbass peace process. Uh, I'm confident that this is uh, the reaction of Zelensky and his administration is uh, because they failed in the peace uh, delivery process uh, in the East. So they try to attack Medvedchuk uh, to bring the Russians to the table, but uh, I think they uh, they don't know 
they 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 wrong uh, understand uh, the Russians and, and the size of the sides in this story. Um, I, I uh, regarding the the question of um, the Donbas channel and. Uh, uh, I, I, in, in, in 2015, uh, when I served in Donetsk region, uh, I was supporting uh, from the budget money as a local uh, TV channel. And, uh, uh, and, and the problem was that uh, finally I refused to support this idea. So we created, uh, based on the local regional channel, we created the new channel, which was called Dot, Dot it's like for you. Uh, and and we we uh, funded them from the budget, but finally I understand that this was a huge mistake, because you have to understand again, the question is not about the channel, the question is about the content of, of, of which channel is showing, and uh, uh, the state TV channels they will never have a good uh, a competitive content. This is like to say that we can have the uh, super state state enterprises or other things. They will always fail to the private uh, TV channels. And actually this happened in, in, in the Donetsk regions when the regional television was uh, weaker uh, with the content than the, the city TV channels like in, in small cities uh, in like it was Krasnormaysk uh, at that moment. And, and so I, I saw that this was the mistake. We should not fund uh, the TV channels, we should fund uh, content. So bring us a cool TV show and we should fund it. When we consider that this TV show is cool, let's fund it, not the TV channel. And, and the same is uh, about this uh, Donbass channel. Who is watching it? Uh, who, needs it who needs the channel? It's, 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 it's a big mistake, it's a big waste of state money and so on. I, instead of that, I, this 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 sum of sum of money I would invest in the bloggers who are from this uh, IDPs. I would invest in the clubs, in some uh, some Facebook bloggers, uh, YouTube channels, and other things because I know that they gather more content, uh, more more viewers than than these channels and and even the state uh, this uh, broadcasting television and so on. And actually, the case of Shari shows that uh, uh, with the using of social media and others, you can be more effective than the TV channel. He, he gathers more viewers than, than the even big TV channel. Uh, so this is, uh, I, I, I strongly do not support this approach of uh, banning or creating the state agencies. For me, it's uh, the same uh, story about Soviet Union that we had actually. So we have to be creative, we have to be innovative. And, and for, for, for Ukraine, and actually Ukraine uh, shows the best cases of uh, how society, uh, in society initiatives are more stronger than state initiatives. So when you have, for example, journalist uh, investigators, give them money from the state budget for their activity. Do not create a TV channel because they already do the job they already are popular without your money. They will be more popular and be more effective when you fund them. So it's a normal practice of the grants and other things that state could uh, should provide to the more effective society initiatives. The same, if you remember, in 2014, uh, the society initiatives to uh, to resist the Russian propaganda and fakes was were more effective than any state steps. And uh, even now we use uh, and the world known initiatives like stop fake and other things. This is, was the uh, initiatives of, of small groups of people. And, and the state politics, uh, on my opinion, should uh, 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 support this initiative, should be based on supporting this small and, and successful initiatives. And the same about the disinformation center. Uh, what I, I have read, it's a, a kind of state stop fake. But what for you create the state stop fake? You already have the good initiative, the very famous world initiative. Let's make it strong. Let's make it stronger. Yeah. So it's the same if uh, I don't know the Netherlands uh, would say, okay, we should create a state Bellingcat because uh, Bellingcat is uh, is not we are not control it. So let's create the state Bellingcat. So this is the same story, and um, I, I'm I, I'm actually I'm a person who participated in a lot of 
informational operations against Russians on their territory and, and here in Ukraine. And I know how the things works. And uh, what I know is that state and the capacity of uh, the Security Council, they, they don't have this capacity, they don't have the good experts on that, uh, and, and so on. So again, uh, when, when you do the state initiative, but you have the real initiative, you just waste your money and you will be not successful about that. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, I, I did a paper a couple of years ago about some of these centers, which Angelina was referring to, that uh, cropped up in the, the wake of the disinformation phenomenon. And I kind of refer to some of them as the Band-Aid effect. We think it's going to solve all of the problems, but in many ways, a lot of the civil society initiatives are, are stronger, they're more well-recognized. And if we could figure out budgetary ways to support them directly and maintain editorial independence, um, I, I too do feel that that could be more effective, but we'll have to wait and see before we pass judgment on this Ukrainian initiative. Uh, Misha, I'd like to turn to you for both of those questions on timing. Um, if you'd like to add anything about how to support independent media, and then we'll get to some audience questions before we close out today. Okay, thank you, Nina. Well, first of all, about timing. I think uh, one, one of the reasons to make those sanctions, again, and the fourth channel was closed without any official sanctioning at all. So all these uh, media outlets belonging, allegedly belonging to uh, Medvedchuk, uh, they were closed as a part of the message to Kremlin. I agree with this, it's definitely the case. But there's also the other side uh, uh, of, the, of these decisions. It's more connected with the political competition between opposition, different groups in the opposition and the ruling group. The, the, the ruling party is losing its popularity. The, the, the servants of the people are not among the most popular groups anymore. Our president is still the most popular politician, but his rating was dropping down as well. So in a way, uh, the, he needed some critical uh, steps showing that he's the leader of the nation. And he decided to, to make these steps in the end of January, beginning of the February, when, uh, when there was as a wave, a new wave of social protests around Ukraine, partially organized by uh, Medvedchuk related political group, not only him, but Right now, the decision was in terms of uh, in terms of the message to Moscow. I don't know how successful this message was. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we the a longer term we'll see the result. So far, all we see is uh, worsening of the situation of security situation on the front line. But when we look at the political competition, this set of decisions was successful. There was uh, president has gained several points in for his rating and uh, Yuri Boyko as the leader of this opposition group has lost almost 40% of uh, his supporters votes. So Boyko and this uh, party have actually showed themselves very weak and cowards in this popular view. So in a way here, the, the rationale was more successful. And if we talk about the uh, small private initiatives or big institutions supported by government or international organizations, I would say, let's let all the flowers to flourish here. And uh, I, I think both, uh, the, the, well, of course, it's, it would be good if government would be able to provide small initiatives with funding, but let's remember that Ukraine and Ukrainian legal and administrative system is created in a way that this governmental funding creates so many limitations for the initiative that it would ruin basically the effectiveness of private initiative. Uh, I myself run a website. I hope it's not a mass media. It's, it's a platform for philosophers. But again, uh, I would never dream to get any uh, public funding just because it would create a lot of limitations for me and my colleagues. Uh, so let's let's keep this uh, space open for different public, non-public, private initiatives. And that would actually open up and differ Ukraine from Russia, where mass media are so much connected with the regime and uh, are fully under the control. 
So here, the asymmetry that Ukraine can create, having less uh, money, having less people, well, that this is asymmetry can be provided by freedom. It's a very interesting point. Uh, very interesting indeed. Thank you all for your interventions. We're going to turn to some audience questions in our last 15 minutes. We touched on this a little bit, uh, but from Jean Neal, uh, she is interested in better understanding the nature of vaccine disinformation in Ukraine, including sources, intentions, and channels that are being used, and how the government and civil society are responding to it. Um, and I'll also throw in there, uh, do we think the media is doing a good enough job uh, communicating about this challenge? What about the government? I was impressed at, early on during the coronavirus pandemic with the uh, kind of tete a tete Instagram videos that President Zelensky was doing to explain the government's decisions. And those seem to have petered off at this point. So in general about uh, coronavirus, sources of disinformation uh, specifically related to vaccines and government and media civil society response. Uh, Misha, let's start with you. Well, my first education was in medicine. So I, I even worked for some time as a village doctor. And of course, when the epidemic started, I tried to recall this far away <laughs> knowledge that I had and I realized that, well, medical science in these 30 years has made a huge leap ahead. But this progress makes the entire, the entire business of vaccination is very different. So right now, the, the, there's old types of vaccines and new types of vaccines. And the new, we expected that they would be very much uh, more efficient and cheaper. However, it looks, it doesn't look like the case. So we now have a lot of uh, basically scholarly uh, issues and problems. The second layer of problems comes with uh, business. Corporations that use the scholarly inventions, discoveries, uh, and try to sell them, they also do not governments properly. The, the attempts of international community to kind of provide equality for different countries to have access to more or less reliable vaccines uh, is limited. So Ukraine is one of those countries that was among the latest to start vaccination and had problems with getting vaccines. Uh, partially the UN initiative and the EU support and American support was providing Ukrainian government with additional kind of support in gaining the vaccine. However, it's, it didn't lead to the result. So far we have the Covishield, uh, which is an Indian, uh, Indian produced uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. And when you look at uh, political debate around the, the vaccination case, you see immediately first that in these 30 years, the civic education and the science education for general public was definitely doing a bad job. People forgot uh, what vaccination means, what the personal responsibility for your and your family health is. It's, and it's somehow almost not publicly discussed. There are several medicians, popular medicians that try to promote the message, but they, they are not the superstars on Ukrainian TV channels or uh, social media. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of, there are many groups of uh, concerned citizens with lack of knowledge and who invest their fear in different conspiracy theories and uh, Politicians use it. Probably one of the worst cases is connected with uh, uh, Petro Poroshenko, who actually sent a very wrong message about the COVID shield, saying that it's not trustworthy vaccine, and who could probably uh, revert many citizens from uh, from actually agreeing to vaccinate themselves or their elderly parents. So in a way, we are in a situation when politicians 
in their competition with president and presidential team, start abusing the vaccination topic uh, for, for these purposes. And again, this Republican value of common good is forgotten. So in a way, we are in a very difficult situation in Ukraine, not, not only because of the pandemic, but the way we communicate with each other on uh, issues of national importance. Thank you, Misha. Victor, uh, I'm wondering if you want to weigh in on any of the presidential communications surrounding the vaccine uh, or any reaction to how the media and civil society have been responding to vaccine disinformation. Well, uh, I think the most damage to this uh, vaccination was made by the Minister Stepanov, who actually failed very often and very much. And this created uh, a huge distrust uh, to what the uh, state bodies are saying and promoting because uh, he a lot of times uh, changed uh, the time of arriving of the vaccine. He, uh, uh, he was in scandal, corruption, corruption scandal about the Chinese uh, Sinovac uh, vaccine uh, because they tried to buy it with earning money and so on. So finally, they lost trust and now even uh, trying to uh, to achieve this using the TV channels and so on and promoting personally. Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, this will, will, will give better results. Uh, for the moment, uh, uh, more than 40% uh, of the population are not going to, to for vaccination and uh, actually uh, with this vaccine, yeah, because uh, uh, they finally got the new name of this AstraZeneca, but it's a COVID shield. So now you have to communicate that this is the same. But uh, instead, if you would do this previously, if you said it at once that, look, we bring you COVID shield, which is a license of the AstraZeneca, then people would, uh, for other way, uh, would consider the situation. So um, I think the failure, uh, you know, I'm joking that uh, you do not uh, uh, often have to blame the Russian propaganda when you have a lot of incompetence around you. Uh, so uh, uh, this is, I think that this was a huge failure of, of, of the Zelensky and, and his communication uh, approach. And now, uh, for example, I, I'm personally, I'm, I'm very much for the vaccination, but uh, I'm not confident that our families would like to vaccinate with this vaccine. And we are going to wait for another one. Uh, and a lot of people also, they would like to wait for the possibility to buy uh, a Pfizer, for example, or, or, or something uh, or Moderna, which is more trustful and, and, and so on. Also, the big damage also is latest news uh, in Europe that some states blocked uh, the vaccination of AstraZeneca. And this is again in Ukrainian uh, media sphere, it looks like a huge uh, uh, failure of, of the government. And, and, and so on. And also, I want to remind you that we have uh, only small number of vaccines. We have only half a million vaccine in Ukraine, and and, and this is uh, and the process of vaccination is is now became a, a, a matter of jokes, because we have a special application that uh, shows you, for example, that you would need uh, 36 years to get the vaccine uh, with this uh, terms of vaccinations we have now. Yeah, so I think it's a failure and uh, we will need a lot of time, but uh, I think that the most promoting thing for the vaccinations will be not an uh, uh, internal Ukrainian uh, campaign, but external measures like that you have to be vaccinated to visit some states. And I think this will, uh, make, people, will make people more to go for vaccinations than any approaches made from the government. Thank you. Great, thank you, Victor. And Angelina, over to you, and then we'll get one more audience question in before the end. Yes, thank you, Nina. Uh, well, the question was where where this disinformation about vaccination comes from. I will. I'm totally. I totally agree with uh, with uh, Mikhail and uh, Victor on the on the on the failure of the government to provide on time information, uh, not about not only about AstraZeneca, just knowing the general 
level of vaccination in Ukraine, which is one of the lowest in Europe. Several years ago, we had a massive breakout of measles uh, and um, well, the, the, the general situation is disastrous. Uh, uh, so uh, there should have been lots of things done before uh, we even got to know that we will be vaccinated by AstraZeneca or whatever, um, which, which the, the, the ministry and, and the government totally failed. Um, but it's interesting to look, um, to look at uh, sp specific narratives and um, to look at specific needs of Ukrainians in terms of uh, understanding why people are refusing from, from vaccination. It's not only about trust, it's now about refusing. We have doctors, uh, hundreds and thousands of doctors who are refusing to get vaccinated. For example, yesterday, the, the whole hospital in Bukovina, uh, it's a Western Ukrainian uh, region that is suffering the most from COVID. The whole all of the staff, the medical staff, refused to get vaccinated. Um, so it's really important to understand why people are doing this. Uh, it's not about anti-vaccination movements or activities in Ukraine. Unlike some other countries, actually, uh, you, there, is, um, there are no super popular anti-vaccination movements right now in Ukraine that are very active on, on social media or in the media generally. Um, our laboratory of the public interest journalism are right now currently finishing a, a big project about uh, vaccination. It is specifically looking at how media should work and, uh, you know, explain vaccination, talk about vaccination in order to have trust of the audience. So we made lots of um, uh, service and national polls and content analysis. And we were quite really amazed to see that actually Cons conspirational theories, um, conspiracy theories are not so popular among Ukrainians. Only about 5% of Ukrainians really believe, you know, in Bill Gates and chipping things and other things. The majority, the reason number one for Ukrainians why they refuse or they have some reservations in terms of vaccination is because they don't understand how it works. They don't understand the after effects they they don't understand you know what is the difference between this vaccine and that vaccine uh, so this um, informational mass uh, is really causing people you know to say that okay we're gonna wait for something else to arrive we're gonna wait for something else to come uh, very quickly just a, a, a private thought and the private position. I will get vaccinated with whatever is here, whatever is available. I am on the list, and I think uh, if if I look at the, I didn't look at the digital, you know, uh, line. I think it's it will take me sixty or seventy years to wait. But uh, because of the refusals uh, from the people who are first in the line, from the doctors, there's a possibility for people like my like myself. Um, to get vaccinated with vaccines who were basically uh, refused by the doctors or pensioners or other people who are first in the line. This is why, um, you know, when you, you when you have a package of AstraZeneca, there are ten small bottles in there, and ten doses, and uh, they can last only for something like six hours, for a limited amount of time. And if, for example, you you made a shot, you, you vaccinated eight people and there are two left and no one else is coming, you need to throw it away in several hours. This is why the local administrations are calling for everyone who wants to get vaccinated to, you know, to get this mm -hmm. vaccine. So uh, it's a paradox. We have only <laughs> half a million here available and, and the massive refusals it should, be, uh, it should be dealt with, of course, on the national level. Yeah, it clearly seems to be a communication uh, breakdown there. Um, so we only have two minutes left. I'm going to put you all on the spot for a, a broader question, just very shortly, succinctly to, to wrap up your views about the media bans. Um, from Anatoly Marushchak of American University, uh, what, if any, will be the, the implications for freedom of speech and rule of law as a, as a result of these bans? Just very quickly, let's start with Victor. Will there be uh, implications just in a few words? Uh, well, actually, I'm very worried about another thing. The Russians are too silent. 
And, and this is for me the most scaring uh, thing that actually I observe after the banning of the Medvedchuk's media. The last si silence of such a kind I remember before the Crimea occupation. That's a very scary thought. Over to you, uh, Mikhailo. Well, I, I think that society and uh, journalist community will adapt, but it's not uh, working in favor of Ukrainian democracy and Ukrainian rule of law. And Angelina, last but not least. It's very important to see what other decisions are coming in this sort of, of a package. You cannot have this massive ban coming just, you know, as a one, one step. Lots of things that we've been discussing here for the last one hour and a half uh, should, should be considered commonplace. And uh, if they do, then there might be, you know, a possible solution to the problem, which is disinformation and propaganda, which is part of the war. Uh, but also basically uh, the concerns of uh, freedom of speech, um, the structure of uh, media market, um, and um, yet just general transparency and um, all the things that we've, we've just discussed. So lots to think about. Uh, thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you to you all for tuning in today, spending your Friday morning with us. Um, please, uh, if you're interested in learning more about Ukraine and hearing more from our Kennan Institute experts, do take note that on Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern time, we'll be hosting another webcast on Minsk II and the Donbass conflict six years later. Thanks again. Have a lovely afternoon.